Hello there, uh, Breaks class. Here is our second video of disc brakes. It should go by a little bit faster. That first section, I always get caught up on rotors, but there's always so much to talk about. So I'm gonna go back to our screen sharing and we are gonna talk a little bit more about brake pads. So we'll get into that. And here we are. Okay, so the last video we got uh, left off talking about cross-drilled and slotted rotors. And here we go. Okay, and we talked about the pros and cons. Um, let's talk a little bit about rotor thickness. You guys know all about this because we talked about this in class before, uh, before I left for my training. So we know what minimum thickness is, right? Uh, we know that on our rotor, it's generally stamped. If not, the specifications are in ProDemand or all data or some sort of service information on how thin that rotor could possibly get before we have to discard it legally, right? Now, when we go to service that rotor, I know we haven't turned rotor yet, rotors yet in class, uh, but we have been measuring them. When we go to turn the rotor, we need to make sure that we don't turn that rotor all the way to its minimum thickness because we do need to account for the fact that it is going to wear a bit as the customer drives with it. So after you're done machining it, you wanna leave at the very minimum 15 thousandths on top of that minimum thickness, uh, all the way to 30 thousandths over the minimum thickness, but at least 15 thousandths over the minimum to account for where if we don't do that, then uh, it'll get thin as the customer drives it and then they can warp. And again, liability, we wanna make sure that we're, we're you're protecting yourself. And we also care about the customer's uh, safety as well. So just make sure you're leaving some meat on that rotor after you're done machining it and you go to put it back on the vehicle. Uh, while we're here, I do just wanna briefly explain that you should never have to machine a brand new rotor. However, uh, when, I, when it comes to thickness or warpage or run out, I have had experience with really cheap rotors. Sometimes they will come with a run out built into them, which if, you, if your rotor brand new comes with rotor run out built into it, uh, sorry to any rotor companies out there who, who have subpar standards, but it's trash. Um, and now you have to put the man hours in to actually turn the rotor. You're going to need to charge the customer for that. At that point in time, you should have just bought a better rotor. So uh, I'd be taking it back and, and returning it for a better brand. So anyways, uh, brand new rotors, you should be able to slap back on the vehicle. Um, if not, and you're just servicing the rotors, make sure you leave at least 15 to thousandths thickness over the minimum thickness stamped on the rotor or provided in specifications. The picture I have provided to you here on the PowerPoint presentation shows a caliper being used. We, in fields, sometimes you may see people using uh, digital calipers. I will always recommend that you use a micrometer um, just because they are a bit more accurate. But um, at that point in time, it, it's up to you as the technician. Um, you always want to be as accurate as possible because, again, the liability will fall on you or your shop that you're using. So, uh, brake pads. There are different types. I want to talk a little bit about the construction rather than the material first. Um, right off the bat, an older design and uh, a good design, but it has some downfalls, is a riveted brake pad. Riveted meaning if you're looking at the picture that I'm looking at right now, it's going to go ahead and show that it has sort of these holes in it. That means that the brake pad lining material, and you can notice that the backing plate, it even shows it labeled here for you, friction material versus backing plate. And I know we kind of are bouncing back, back and forth using terms like lining material and friction material. Um, this is straight, this picture straight out of your book. And in the book even talks about friction material actually being the rotor rather than the pad and that the pad is a lining material, neither here nor there. Um, I'm just gonna use the term rotor and pad. The pad material, uh, is actually riveted to the backing plate using rivets, obviously riveted. Um, here are some advantages and disadvantages. So 
What's really cool is that the riveted brake pads are generally a little bit quieter because they allow for some flex. However, just like cross drilling, those holes create stress points. Uh, and so riveted brake pads, because of those holes, are a little bit um, more prone to cracking than say regular mold bonded pads or something like that. So um, just something to think about there. Um, <clears throat> Uh, also, a lot of times you may not get as much usage out of riveted brake pads because of the rivets uh, sort of sit on top of the backing plate. So um, there's that. Uh, the next type would be mold bonded brake pads. So mold bonded brake pads don't need any rivets. However, uh, I kind of skimmed right over, or not skimmed, but I didn't even talk about it. I don't even have a slide for it because we don't use it anymore. There used to be pads that were just bonded, not mold bonded, just bonded, meaning the pad material is simply glued to the backing plate. There's a problem with that. What happens when that glue fails? Not good stuff, right? So what will happen is once that glue completely fails, the pad will simply slide off of the backing plate uh, leaving you with just simply a backing plate um, and that can create some serious issues. So we kind of stopped doing that, uh, which is why I went straight into mold bonded pads. So mold bonded pads, not just glue, notice it says bonded, so there is glue involved that mold, uh, glue the or bond the pads to the backing plate, but they also, if you look in the picture here, have put a couple of holes in the backing plate and actually molded the kind of like a puzzle piece or a Lego piece fitting into another Lego piece. It actually sits inside of, of the pad material sits inside of the backing plate. So even if the glue fails, it will not separate. Now, once you pull the assembly apart, the pad may come off of the backing plate, but at least it will hold the pad material in place. So mold bonded is really the way to go rather than just bonded. Um, there's no more rivets, which allows you to use more of the pad material, which is pretty cool. There's no holes in the pad material, which means we don't have as much uh, stress cracking going on. Uh, the only problem, like I said, is the lining coming unglued, but that's where the molding comes into play. Um, it, it will at least hold the pad in there. You may get some clunking or noises involved when the bonding material comes unglued. However, it is quite rare, um, especially with the new technology. I, it's been years and years since I've seen pads that became unbonded. Um, so we see a lot less of that now uh, with as glue technology comes uh, into play. Something else I wanna talk about is edge codes. So on your pads, how do you know how good your pad is at producing friction? Remember, we, we know that term coefficient of friction, COF. Um, that COF or coefficient of friction actually has a code on the pad. So the higher the coefficient of friction or the lower the coefficient of friction, that is uh, marked on the pad to tell you how good or how bad it is. Those codes are called edge codes. And on the edge code, uh, it is marked with a double letter. The first letter, and you can see here on the slide, is a quote unquote cold. I think 250 degrees Fahrenheit is still hot to us, but it's considered still cold for a brake pad. The first letter is referring to the cold at 250 degrees coefficient of friction. The second letter is a quote unquote hot at 600 degrees coefficient of friction. Some pads like racing pads, <coughs> and I mentioned this in class, racing pads, they don't care about cold operation because if you're racing, especially on, um, especially something like autocross style racing, where the pads are pretty much hot all the time once you warm them up, they, they, they are more concerned with hot coefficient of friction than they are with cold coefficient of friction. If this is your daily driver and you like to track your daily driver, well, you want good cold coefficient of friction and you want good hot coefficient of friction. So that's something to think about. And I will tell you right now, um, I myself have bought pads that I thought, oh man, yeah, these are performance pads, so they're gonna work great all the time. Uh, little did I know, because I didn't look at the edge codes, 
they had a really crappy coefficient of friction when they were cold, uh, but really good when they were hot. Well, I don't do a break-in or warm-in procedure or warm-up procedure for my brake pads every time I drive the car. So uh, I, I noticed, man, these brakes sort of suck. I couldn't even get it into an ABS stop. Um, and lo and behold, the coefficient of friction was very different from cold to hot. So when you're buying performance brake pads, this is something that you want to really take a look at. Um, but uh, I'll show you a picture here in a moment. So uh, it can be on the backing plate as in the picture. So if you look at that picture up close, that first code, it's like SST17EE. -E. It's kind of like a, DOT, a tire DOT number where it's sort of the end there at the end, it shows the two letters that are the coefficient of friction uh, from the edge code. Well, if they're the same letter, then that means the coefficient of friction when it's cold is the same as when it's hot. It's an E when it's cold and it's an E when it's hot, right? And if you look at the bottom picture, sometimes instead of putting it on the backing plate, they'll actually put it on the pad materials as the pad wears note that you won't be able to see it but brand new you should be able to see it uh somewhere stamped on the pad itself if not it should be on the box somewhere so if we go ahead and look back here e you can see has a lower coefficient of friction than f so you can see the top pads there have a lower coefficient of friction than the bottom pads and that's just some a, you know a resource to just look at as you're looking for performance brake pads when you take the pad and caliper assembly apart uh, off the disc brake assembly, you'll notice that uh, on, on the right here is a picture of, we just talked about it, riveted brake pads. And you can see, as I mentioned, they are prone to stress cracking and lo and behold, there you go, is a picture of stress cracking. You can have stress cracking or heat cracking from mold bonded pads as well. You don't want uh, cracked pads if you are inspecting them and you notice that there are cracking. Will the pads still work? Yes, but you could have issues. Um, I always recommend for customers to change pads that are cracked. If it's my personal vehicle, I may leave it, but uh, hell, if I'm driving the vehicle and a chunk comes off the pad, I know why and what happened, but if a customer is driving their vehicle and a chunk of the pad comes off and they end up with uh, braking issues, it's kind of important and they don't know why, right? So uh, it can also create noise. It can create weak points in the pad. So chunks of the pad can come off later times. So you really want to get rid of those cracking uh, on the pads and, and replace the pads. Um, you guys have already performed the brake inspection using the little window on the caliper on the left picture here. Um, so you should be able to see the lining thickness. As a technician, you don't necessarily, if you're just inspecting brake pads, you may not get paid for the amount of time it will take for you to take apart the caliper and all that good stuff and torque everything back together. And now you're liable uh, if something comes apart in the, the caliper because you took it apart. So um, if you're just doing an inspection on a customer's vehicle using that window, with your lining thickness gauge is going to be probably your best bet but if you're doing a full-fledged brake inspection um, and you're getting paid for that then you're going to want to take it apart take a look at the pads a lot of times if customers are complaining about noise from braking i will take apart the caliper to look at the pads to see if there's contamination if there's rocks um, if there's cracking um, the the uh, status of lubrication on the pads uh, not on the pads but on the slides i'm sorry um, because that can create some issues as well. So uh, we'll get into that a little bit more here. One more thing about pad inspection. A lot of your mold bonded pads will have a little wear indicator, kind of like tires, which is cool. However, um, I don't use that as a sure thing. Like, oh, well, there's plenty of wear indicator left. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and leave it. Or the wear indicator's low. Pads need to be replaced. That may not be the case. So um <clears throat> use the wear indicator so that divot once that divot is worn flush it's a general guideline that the pads should be replaced i would always recommend using a lining thickness gauge the ones that we used in class with the little green yellow and red fingers on them that will tell you exactly what the measurement is you can't argue uh a customer cannot argue um a repair order that actually has numbers from a measurement on that 
and that will always be your best friend as a technician to save your butt. So always use the lining thickness gauges, uh, the wear indicators, and just a general guideline. Um, moving along here, and here's a good picture actually on the riveted brake pads, which is why you can't use all of the pad material on a riveted brake pad. Um, again, another advantage of mold bonded pads. Caliper operation, uh, I, this is simply talking about um, the square cut seal that's going to allow the piston to come out and pull it back in as it flexes. So what we're looking at here, if you're looking at the picture, is what we call a sliding caliper. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment, the differences. Uh, but if you look at the picture here, um, and this is really sort of hard, let me see if I can point the mouse where I want you to look. So this little area here, if you're looking at the picture, I've got the mouse sort of outlining it. That's our dust boot. That's simply allowing uh, or, or keeping from dirt and debris getting into where the piston is. But if you look right past that dust boot, this area here, it looks like a little square on the top and the bottom here. That square is actually a seal that goes around the entire piston. We call it a square cut seal. It's like an O-ring except for it is in the shape. And when I say in the shape, the seal itself the seal is a circle, and I'm not going to take me out of screen share, um, but just if you're looking at the tiny little me in the corner, uh, the seal is still round in its shape. But if I look at the, if I was to cut the seal uh, to split it, I would actually, and, and look at the shape of that seal, it is actually a square. Um, it needs to be a square. So if we're looking at the mouse here again, as that square flexes, so the piston moves out, the seal flexes, and when I let off the brake, no more hydraulic pressure behind the piston, it sort of spring loads back. So let me go ahead and go to the next slide so you can see what that looks like. So the beige, portion, uh, sorry, the beige portion is your caliper housing. The dark orange portion here is the piston moving out and then being spring loaded back in. So at rest, you can see where my mouse is here. Um, at rest, that square cut seal is a square, right? When I push my piston outward, right? I press on my brake pedal, I build up hydraulic pressure behind the piston, the piston moves out. You can see my square cut seal is now deflecting. It's sort of stretching. Um, that square cut seal is now what we might know as spring loaded. So when I let off of the brake pedal and there's no more hydraulic pressure pushing the piston out and I wanna let off of the brake, that spring loading or deflecting of the seal wants to go right back to where it's at in its resting mode, which allows it to pull the piston back. Now, when the brake pad wears down, my piston needs to travel further. So as that happens, when the piston travels further, it will deflect the seal and then actually pass its deflection, move the piston. But since the seal is still spring loaded, once I let off the brake, it's still going to want to just inch back just a hair, which is enough to keep the pad off of the rotor. We're talking a very minimal clearance here um, because we don't we, we want our brake pedal to, to have a very small travel. If there was a lot of clearance and the pad had to travel a super far distance every time to touch the rotor, you'd have a really low brake pedal. Um, so we're just talking minimal amounts of movement here, but that's how our caliper piston works. I have shared some videos with you guys in the resource video area or disc brake video section of the module. Um, so if you haven't, after you've watched all these videos, this lecture, the presentation, you did your homework, and you have more questions about this, this area, just go ahead and shoot it in the discussion board and we can talk about it. And I, I'm, if I need to make another video uh, of drawing how this works, I can do that too. Um, but hopefully that's pretty clear for you guys. There is something called a low drag caliper, meaning we want the pad a little bit further away from the rotor uh, 
so we don't get any drag. There are some vehicles that are like this. You can see in the caliper housing itself, there's actually an angle to allow for a further deflection of that square cut seal, uh, but the same action applies. There's just more distance being traveled with a low drag caliper. And if you do your homework, there's probably a question about quick take up master cylinders um, that allow for extra movement as well for this action. Let's talk quickly about uh, fixed caliper operation, then we'll talk about floating calipers. So fixed caliper operation, uh, the caliper does not slide. The caliper stays in place. And I've got pistons on both sides and pads on both sides that are pushing up against the rotor. As you're working on fixed calipers, and I cannot stress this enough, you need to be very, very careful when you're removing the caliper on which caliper bolts get removed. There are some bolts in the caliper that act as a seal. And if you take it out, a ton of hydraulic fluid is going to come out and now you're going to have a big problem. Um, even if you put the bolt back, it's going to create a hydraulic leak. You need to replace the copper washers in, in, as a technician, you get paid for all that extra time because you screwed up. So, uh, you want to be very, very careful and paying attention to which bolts are mounting the caliper and which bolts are actually, uh, hydraulic seals. And the reason why all those extra bolts are there, uh, so you can mount hydraulic lines in various areas and, and stuff like that. A lot of fixed calipers, uh, are for universal kits or like say Brembo or Willwood. A lot of those will come in a, a universal fit sort of design. And so they may have different areas. Sorry about that. Let me just try to get back out of that here. Apologize. Um, I think we're back to our screen sharing. Here we go. Um, I, there's a YouTube link here, but I believe it goes to the same video that I shared with you guys on my, um, on, on the disc brake videos. I gave you a video on how sliding calipers work and I gave you a video, a detailed video on how fixed calipers work. Um, what's really nice about fixed calipers. Let's say you're just doing a quick pad change. You're not turning the rotors. Everything looks fine. Um, and you're just changing pads you don't have to take the calipers off. So it's super nice, you just take some of the, there's two slide pins you'll remove, pull the pads out, uh, put new pads in, regrease your slide pins, go ahead and put those slide pins back in, fix any uh, anti-rattle springs that you may have had to take off and you're good to go. Super fast and easy design. However, if you need to take the caliper off, sometimes there's some extra steps in there. Um, also, uh, while I'm here, a lot of fixed caliper designs, especially the universal fit ones I was just talking about, they have bleeders on top and bottom, which is really nice. Uh, if you're converting a kit uh, or using a kit to convert to these high performance fixed caliper designs, um, as long as they're, if the bleeder is on top and bottom, no big deal, you can sort of flip flop them. Uh, the bleeder always needs to go toward the top though if you don't have bleeder screws on top and the bottom. If you put the bleeder screw on the bottom, the air will travel to the top and will never want to come out. And you will chase and chase and chase air in that system. So just a little tech tip. I ran into that problem in, the, in, in my experience as a technician. Uh, car came in and uh, customers like, yeah, every shop I take it to, they can't uh, they can't fix the brake pedal, brake pedal spongy, and as soon as they take a look at it, I'm like, well, you got bleeder screws on the bottom when they need to be on top, and it's simply because the calipers were on the wrong side and needed to be flipped, and as soon as we did that, uh, we were able to get all the air out of the system, and it was no big deal, so just pay attention to where that bleeder screw is um, when you are converting uh, or, or adding performance kits on there. Here's a couple of pictures of what they look like. You can see here, here are some slide pins where the mouse is at and some anti-rattle and anti-noise or squeal springs. If you do not put those back, you will get noise complaints from customers. So make sure that they always go back. Um, here on the right, we've got a Brembo kit. There's our slide pins there. Uh, on this design, you may not be able to pull the pads out. That depends. But you can see that there is bleeders on both sides because I have pistons on both sides, but 
if you notice, I've got bleeders on the top, but nothing on the bottom. So if I was to accidentally take this caliper and put it on the wrong side, my bleeders are on the bottom, I'll never be able to get the air out. So again, just something to pay attention to. Also on the left, this looks more like an OEM design uh, that, that bleeders right here. You can see these bolts here where my mouse is at. If you remove those bolts, you will end up with a hydraulic leak. So be very careful of which bolts you are removing. Next is a floating caliper design. Again, I gave you a video in your disc break. There's a link here on uh, the PDF. I don't know if it'll work. You could at least copy and paste it. However, um, I did give you a floating caliper uh, operation video in the module under disc break videos. Um, you only have a piston on one side and uh, you have slide pins that once the piston pushes on one side, it will actually push the whole housing over to engage both sides of your pads. Um, most important thing to know on slide caliper designs. Every time you do a brake job, pull the slide pins out, take them out, pull all the old grease off, clean it nice and good, put some new high temp brake grease on them. If you keep the slides clean, you will have even pair or even pair, even wear on both your pads and you won't get near as many noise complaints. Also anywhere where the pads may slide, and this goes for any type of caliper design, you want to go ahead and lubricate it. But I cannot stress this enough, do not get brake grease on the pads. If you get brake grease on the pads, they will contaminate them. And here's what happens. You think, oh, grease on pads, it's not going to break very good. Is actually the exact opposite. If I get any brake grease or oil on the pads, they lock up and you will have some major issues there. Um, so to prevent that from happening, keep your pads nice and clean. If you get a little bit of grease on it, just go ahead and uh, clean it off with some brake clean. If you get a boatload on it and you saturate it, the pads are trash, just get new ones. Don't even screw around with it. Um, uh, but you just want to make sure you don't contaminate the pads. Also, uh, take a look. If you look here with my pointing with my mouse, uh, the caliper slides have little dust boots on them. Take care not to rip those uh, because if you rip those, then grime and dust and dirt can get inside where the slides are at. You get a caliper that uh, won't slide. You'll have the inside pad wear out a lot faster than the outside pad, and uh, customers will complain uh, of man, I just had my pads changed. Well, the caliper is not sliding, so it's only using one pad. Uh, so you'll get all types of brake complaints on that. So just keep your slides lubricated, make sure they're protected. Uh, always fresh grease, make sure you don't get any grease on those pads. Here's another uh, picture of your greased um, disc brake pad, or I'm sorry, a sliding caliper crease. <sighs> Your sliding caliper design, you can always tell because they've got these slide pins. I wanna see where my mouse is at. Um, and they'll have little dust boots on them. You can also note right here, if you follow where my mouse is at, there is a frame on a sliding caliper design only. Uh, there's a frame of where the caliper mounts to and then there's the caliper housing. So they will actually be two separate pieces um, what's nice about the sliding caliper design is you can always just undo the bottom bolt, flip the whole caliper housing up, and gain access to the pads there. But if you need to take the rotor off, the whole housing and frame needs to come off as well. And you can see here's another example of a floating rotor as well. You can see our little hold down screws there. A lot of pads come with noise reduction springs here. Just a bunch of different examples. Not all manufacturers use the same design. Not all manufacturers even use these springs. Uh, just some, Toyota and Lexus really likes to use them. Um, there, there's a lot of manufacturers who like to use them. If it has noise springs, they need to go back or get replaced with new ones, but you can't leave them off. If you leave them off, you are going to get squealing and the customer is going to be like, what the hell? Um, here's uh, some more designs here. Here is uh, some contamination, a rock or, or uh, something in there. A lot of your pads you'll notice are tapered at the end. If the pads are not tapered, sometimes they can create noise. I actually have had completely flat pads where the customer, we chased noises, everything is lubricated, the pads are not contaminated. 
everything's fine, but we cannot get rid of that squeal. Um, sometimes just sanding the edges of those pads down and chamfering them a little bit completely takes that whole problem away. Uh, you just want to be careful. Anytime you're sanding any pad material, always know it may contain asbestos. And so make sure you're wearing uh, breathing protection or respiratory protection on that. You can see this kind of pad and this kind of pad is that design where there's no chamfer. Um, so I have had issues in the past where that has happened. A lot of pads are uh, equipped with wear indicators. Most of them are mechanical. So if you look at the picture on the left, it's a little clip that hangs onto the pad. And once the pad wears down, the clip will just sort of uh, graze across the rotor and make a squealing sound. Most of the time that sound is actually when you're not pressing on the brakes, oddly enough, and will sort of go away as you press on the brakes. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you have a customer that's got a squeal, that's one of the first things I look at. The brake pads are probably worn down. If they're not, there's probably contamination or lack of lubrication going on here. Um, another design, BMW loves this design. In fact, actually a lot of German manufacturers in Mercedes likes this design. On the right here, they'll actually have a little sensor, an electronic sensor that goes into your brake pad. The problem is, is every time, if you wear your brake pads down all the way to that sensor, uh, cool part is, is it'll throw in a little brake light telling the customer, hey, go in and change your brakes. Um, the problem is, is that once that electrode has been worn through to turn on that light, the sensor is trashed. So when you go to replace the brake pads, you have to replace the sensors as well. In some vehicles, it's really expensive. Others, it's inexpensive. It might be an extra $15 per side. Uh, it really depends on your make and model for those designs. But uh, I always try to tell customers uh, with those designs um, to try to uh, come in for an inspection before that happens. Um, because a lot of times, I've had good luck where if the pads aren't worn down to the sensor, you may be able to reuse those sensors. Um, but from a technician standpoint, it's always good practice to change those sensors along with the brake pads. So just be upfront with your customer about that. Uh, some, especially older uh, Chevy design, uh, Chevy used this design, other companies did too, especially domestics on the older brake pads. Uh, they new brake pads that may come, and you can see here, with little tabs, that brand new ones are not bent. And once you put the brake pads on, you actually need to use a hammer to bend those tabs to hold the brakes in place. Um, and you'll get all kinds of clunking and noise and braking complaints if you don't bend those tabs. So that's just something to think about. You don't really see this on newer vehicles. This is something I only saw when I was working on old cars. One more thing I really wanna get into is when you are replacing a set of brake pads, something you need to do, and this is something I know a lot of you guys are like, I've replaced brake pads and I didn't have to do this or I didn't do it and nothing bad happened. The caliper piston is self-adjusting, right? So as the pads wear down, the piston comes out further and further and further. Well, when you go to put in a brand new set of pads, that piston is too far out and will not accommodate for the amount of space needed for brand new thick pads. So you have to push the caliper piston back in its housing. Here's where everybody goes wrong. When you press the caliper piston back in its housing, you need to think about the fluid that's behind that piston. Most of your brake fluid is not exposed to a whole lot except for the fluid that's behind the caliper piston. It gets exposed to the most amount of heat changes um, and uh, seal material and things like that. It gets contaminated and it's dirty and it's mucky. So when you press that caliper piston back in its housing, you take all that nasty, gunky fluid and that worn down fluid and you shove it back into the system, which can make its way back to the master cylinder. And you could cause premature master cylinder uh, wear or malfunction by doing that um, or not doing it correctly. So here's the correct way before you use a clamp or special tool to push the caliper piston back in its housing. You can go ahead and apply the tool, but before you push the piston back in, pop open, you can see here in the picture where the mouse is, pop open your bleeder screw. 
we've got a hose connected to a little cup here. You don't even have to do that. Um, just pop open the bleeder screw. Just make sure you clean up your mess afterward. Pop open that bleeder screw, then apply force to the piston, whether you're using a C-clamp or you're using a piston retracting tool. Um, apply pressure on the piston and you're gonna see a bunch of nasty, dirty fluid come out of the bleeder screw. One more thing before you're done, before you remove the force of that tool, whether it's the C-clamp or the retracting tool, leave it applied. Close the bleeder screw first and then remove the clamp. If you don't do this correctly and you remove the clamp first and then close the bleeder screw, there's a small amount of movement that the piston will move out and it will suck air back into the bleeder and now you're gonna have a spongy brake pedal. Um, and now you're gonna have to bleed it. You don't get paid for all that. However, uh, if you do this correctly, it's seriously an extra 30 seconds of work that will make the master cylinder last longer. Um, you obviously will need to add a little bit of brake fluid because you're gonna lose some as you push the piston out or push the piston back, push the, push the piston back in. Um, that bleeder screw being open is going to allow fluid out, that dirty fluid. You're gonna close the bleeder screw, remove the clamp, Put your new brake pads that are, the slides are greased, all that fun stuff. Get everything back together. And then once everything's all said and done, check your master cylinder and go ahead and add the needed amount of brake fluid. Um, I will do a demo on this if you're not sure how, what I'm talking about or if you have any extra questions when we get back into lab. But this is such a big thing that so many people don't do when they're doing a brake job. And uh, it, it does cause premature wear of your master cylinder. Um, so if you care about your, your customers uh, at all, you should do this. It's good practice. And especially on your own vehicles too. Um, again, if you want things to last a little bit longer, um, it, it is proper procedure to do that. Also, one more important thing on here is anytime you pull the caliper off and you need to do any work, maybe you're doing suspension work, maybe you're doing drive axle work, maybe you're doing brake work, whatever you're doing, you need to make sure that, uh, that you're supporting the caliper with some sort of hanger or, or something on a rigid suspension component, whether it be the spring or, or the knuckle, whatever. What you don't wanna do is hang the caliper from its hose because that brake hose is fragile and you will crack it. And the last thing you want is a customer to leave with a brake leak. Um, again, I can't explain or I can't emphasize enough uh, when you're working on a customer's brakes, you are taking on a huge liability and your safety is in their hands and they're counting on you. It's like when you go to the doctor, you're trusting that they know what they're doing and that they're taking care of you. You are that. You are their car doctor. So just take that into consideration because uh, they're trusting you with their car. So don't take that lightly, especially when it comes to things like brakes work. I, it seems simple, but you have so much in your hands. So um, take care of that. Make sure you're using a hanger. Uh, we just don't want to stress that brake line. Couple of caliper lube points. I already talked about this. Any sleeves or slides that have grease on them need to be re-greased. Uh, your pads, the edges that slide on anything, I always will grease them just with a light amount. The more you goop on there, the more dust and dirt want to stick to it. So you don't need a whole lot. Um, also, the back of any pads that touch anything, I always add a little, just a little light coat of grease on there. Uh, so just some grease points there. Uh, caliper lube points on the caliper itself. You can see here in this picture, uh, we've got slides where my mouse is at here. Those can get greased as well. Um, you wanna knock off, they're using a little grinder piece here. You can use sandpaper, you can use, I like to use um, a wire brush to knock any uh, uh, rust or any debris off of any, any of the slides. Um, that way you have a nice clean area for the pads to slide on. Uh, I did include, so this link is also in the 
uh, disc break videos portion of the module. Uh, I love Science Garage and they did a really awesome video on the different type of brake pad material so you don't have to just listen to me in front of my whiteboard and, and uh, our PowerPoint presentation here. He's got a lot cooler visuals than I do. So um, take a look at that video if you've got questions about like, well, what are ceramic pads better, semi-metallics, um, any of that stuff, because I know I didn't get into that into the lecture and I'm trying not to make the video super long. Um, but he, he gets a lot into the different types of materials. So uh, that's another really good resource there. Uh, normally I would make this homework, but I'm not. So normally I would tell you guys, all right, uh, list these complaints and I want you to tell me next class session what can cause those types of complaints. Um, we'll just talk about it real briefly here. Noise can be due to obviously low pads. We talked about that the sensor touching can cause a squeal. But lack of lubrication is another really big one and especially on hybrid vehicles. Um, something you really want to take into consideration is that uh, the the hybrid vehicles, since they use the motor for regeneration um, and for drag to help brake the vehicles, you are actually using a lot less pad material than you normally would. So a major problem for, for hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles is not necessarily pad wear because they actually last a lot longer than normal pads do or our normal conventional vehicles do. Uh, but the problem is, is that lubrication gets dried up. So sometimes you'll have complaints um, with pulling noise, stuff like that on those types of vehicles pull the brake assembly apart and then um, go ahead and re-lubricate everything if needed. Debris getting in the pads, maybe you get a little pebble or a rock in the pad material that can cause a squealing and it can actually cause a, a divot to wear inside of your rotor. Any missing noise springs, those anti-squeal or anti-rattle springs I was telling you about can create noise. Uh, vibration, meaning when you go to press on the brake pedal, you get a vibration, um, whether it be in the pedal vibrating or whether it be in your steering wheel. Um, we all know that rotor warpage is an issue. Um, we also call that rot rotor runout. And when we get back into class, part of your lab packet is to use a dial indicator on the rotor to check for that runout. Um, but Here's how you tell the difference with a complaint, um, whether the rotors are warped or you have thickness variation, right? So we talked about that last time we were in class with thickness variation. Some parts of the rotor are thicker or thinner than others. So if I have a customer that complains that they have a, uh, a vibration in the steering wheel. So every time they go to stop the vehicle, they get a vibration in the front end of the vehicle or the steering wheel. That's generally going to be rotor warpage. Can also be a wheel bearing, um, but we'll talk more about that later on. Uh, if they have a pedal that pulsates or vibrates, the brake pedal, that's generally going to be thickness variation. That's because the pads are being pushed back in, they come back out. They push back in, come back out. And so you get this feedback in the brake pedal. Dragging of the brake. Uh, so most of the time a customer will complain like, man, um, it feels like I'm braking when I'm not braking, or uh, maybe I'm getting accelerated pad wear, um, or maybe I'm getting really bad gas mileage because the brakes are always being applied, or maybe I'm getting overheating of the brakes because they are always applied. Those, that's brake dragging. Sometimes the caliper piston doesn't want to move on one side, or maybe it's stuck, uh, applied. So what will happen is uh, the caliper actually will need to get rebuilt or broken down. And we'll talk more about that in the next video. Um, we can also get a restricted brake line, so a hard brake line. If you hit a rock or something and it pinches a brake line, we can get hydraulic pressure that stays in the caliper area when it's not supposed to. Um, I can also get a restricted master cylinder that's not allowing pressure to return, um, and that can also be an issue, or uh, lack of lubrication. Uh, so not only can lack of lubrication cause noise, it can also keep the pad from retracting like it's supposed to. 
Accelerated wear uh, can go right back with dragging, but so let's say customers like, man, I just changed the pads and I felt long ago. Sometimes they have just harsh driving conditions and they ride the brake all the time. That may cause accelerated wear. Um, I can also have bad proportioning valves, and we'll get into that when we get into hydraulic systems, but proportioning is going to proportion how much hydraulic pressure goes to the front versus the rear, or the rear versus the front. And if that is not correct, then uh, that, that uh, if, if the proportioning valve is not proportioning correctly, it may put too much pressure in the rear when it shouldn't. And uh, some equal manufacturers like Honda on the Honda Accord, they had a really bad problem with this where they proportion too much brake pressure in the rear. And so they have a lot of issues with the rear pads wearing out faster than the front pads. Um, and it goes hand in hand with dragging brakes. Pulling, I, again, if I've got a restricted brake line that is keeping hydraulic pressure from going to one side, um, it may cause normal braking on one side and restricted braking on one side. So every time you brake, it's gonna pull to the side that is doing more braking. Uh, and that goes right along with C's caliper. If I've got a caliper that's not applying on one side, it will pull every time I go to brake to the side that is actually working. Contaminated brake lining, if I have any brake grease that is actually on the brake pad material, it will grip so much more than the other side that is not contaminated. So I will get brake pulling in that area. And then of course, lack of lubrication. Again, if my pads can't move smoothly, then I may not have application on one side, which will cause pulling um, to whichever side is actually working. If I have an issue where it's hard to stop, like I'm pressing on the brake pedal hard and it doesn't want to stop. Um, first things first, I may have binding components. Um, so you want to just do a quick visual check of everything to make sure nothing is actually bent or binding. Uh, if you have had an issue where the pads had been previously overheated, it's quite common, especially on motorcycles, for the brake pads to get sort of a glaze on them. So you've got the pads and the rotors have sort of this mirror finish, so we don't have a very good coefficient of friction. And then of course, malfunctioning power brakes. So if I don't have a vacuum booster that's working properly, then I'm going to have that. I do wanna mention, if I have a malfunctioning power brake system, my brake pedal is going to feel hard rather than soft. And how I can tell is I, I'm gonna turn the vehicle off and I'm going to eliminate all power brakes. So I'm gonna pump the brakes with the vehicle off until the pedal is really hard, right? Um, on a uh, on certain systems that won't work. We'll get into that when we get into power brakes. But on normal vacuum brake boosters, you're gonna eliminate all of the vacuum for power assist when the vehicle's off. And then you feel, okay, the pedal's really hard. With your pedal depressed, your foot on the brake, you're gonna turn the vehicle on, allowing engine to create vacuum so your vacuum booster can work. We should feel the pedal sink. That is normal. If the pedal does not sink, guess what? You've got a bad vacuum booster. Um, so just keep that in mind. That could create hard stopping as well because you have no assist. And then last but not least for hard to stop, if you put performance pads on that are only good when they're hot and you don't race all the time, then you're gonna have really hard braking and you're gonna be like, man, I'm applying lots of brake pressure and I'm not getting a whole lot of braking. That could be due to an incorrect edge code. Uh, the best way to check would be like, man, before I changed my brake pads, my brakes worked fine and now I changed my brake pads and my brakes suck. Check what kind of pads you had and what the edge codes were compared to the pads that you took off or what's uh, stock. So just keep that in mind. Last but not least, your low pedal. Um, so a pedal uh, that is lower than normal or you have to depress further for anything to engage, number one issue is always air in the hydraulic system because remember that air has to be compressed then we can compress the fluid. So if we have air in the system, that creates issues. Um, I have run across issues in the past where I have a brake hose, like a rubber hose, that the, the hose is actually worn out and got soft. So every time you press on the brake pedal and we create hydraulic pressure in the system, the hose expands. And so uh, it 
the expansion takes up some uh, space for compressing that hydraulic fluid. That's where your uh, steel braided brake lines sort of come into play. You don't get any of that issues. But normally rubber brake hoses don't do that anyways unless they're really worn out. And then last but not least, a low pedal can also be caused by a defective master cylinder. And I did talk about this in class as well. If your brake pedal's fine, but when you're sitting at a red light for a few seconds and you feel that pedal sink down, um, that's generally gonna be a, a defective master cylinder. Now, if you pump it back up, pedal's totally normal, but if you sit there for a minute again, the pedal starts to sink down, that's almost always a bad master cylinder, so just keep that in mind. Um, and before we get into caliper service, I'm just gonna go ahead and switch recording so I can upload the video. Uh, so I will see you guys in the next video here. Uh, and we'll go ahead and stop recording, all right. See you on the flip side.